I think I see a lot of opportunities. Um, and it, and it, it's really more, as I said, more of a productivity tool uh, rather than something that replaces a job function. It um, makes people, it enables people who are unable to do things before to now do things. And it helps people to do their job easier. I think that's the easiest way to, to visualize this. Um, I don't really see um, a voice recognition technology uh, replacing millions of jobs. And I'm not sure I can offhand think of any uh, large scaled new job opportunities this creates. I want you to take a sentence of, let's say, five or six words and show me how hard this is or why it's complicated. If you could just say, I went to the store or something like that, or this, the dog now barked. Show me, pick a sentence and show me what, what the challenge is of how to do this. Because let's say I really don't know anything, and I really don't. Just pick a sentence up that has in it. Okay. Um, an example is, Mr. Wright needs to learn to write right. In that sentence, I have three occurrences of right, and they sound exactly the same. It is only because I have some knowledge about what kind of names, um, that, that right can be a name and it's spelled in a certain way, and the other two rights are, uh, one, one is a verb, one is an adjective, that um, I can understand which, which one meant which, because they all sound exactly the same. And another popular example that speech recon recognition researchers have used is um, we're trying to recognize speech. You've probably heard recognize speech rather than rec a nice beach. Again, the two sound exactly the same. And the only way you can tell that they're different is by applying your, your ability to understand English syntax, your ability to understand what something means, the common sense that nobody's trying to wreck beaches, but there are people trying to recognize speech, uh, that helps you to recognize the sentence. I think it's the human brain's incredible ability to integrate all of these knowledge and, uh, direct and recognize the speech that, that's very hard to emulate. And this, the aut automatic systems try to do that to some extent. I think there's still a long way to go. So digital is also a major player here, isn't it? That it can divide something up into so many parts. It can understand such complex parts. I'm sorry, what's a major? The digital, the digitizing of sound mm -hmm. was a breakthrough. I didn't realize until you said it how important that was in this process. You couldn't have the whole thing if you didn't have a mechanism for breaking down sound into parts. Yes. Uh, actually, the, the digitization converts the analog samples into um, some thousands of samples per second. Uh, the next step then, you have to take those thousands of samples per second and try to recognize uh, what was actually said. And that uh, we usually call the segmentation process turns out to be actually very, very hard. What about the accents problem, the fact that we speak different accents around the country? I mean, mm -hmm. how did you, how have you dealt, are people dealing with that? Is at and dealing with that? Is anybody dealing with that? And how are they dealing with that? Um, the accents is one example of the high degree of variability that's inherent in speech. And I think that's the single biggest problem and challenge for speech recognition is to deal with these variabilities. Uh, and other, other examples are um, different speakers have different vocal track lengths, speak differently. Um, the environment changes, the microphone changes. Um, all of these things have impact on how the digital speech is realized. So there has to be some mechanism of dealing with these variabilities. Uh, currently, the most successful method has been to use a statistical model and to present this model with enough types of different speech under stress, uh, speaking fast, slow, uh, northern accents, southern accents, male, female, children, all mixed together, and then let the statistical model learn what, is, what, what the variabilities what the variabilities are and how to separate them apart. I think um, right now the systems are probably not sophisticated enough, nor is there enough data to really build a model for Boston accent or for Midwestern accent. But someday I think that would be useful. And I think for some languages that would be crucial. Uh, people in England 
the, the idea of an accent really is very, very different. Uh, one accent is extremely different from another. Scottish, Irish, for example. In China and India, the same problems prevail. In the U.S., we're fortunate that even though we have accents, there is really a lot of commonalities and similarities that these statistical techniques are currently sufficient to deal with them. But I think in the future, we need to really look into uh, the fundamental differences of dialects and accents. So, you, I mean, your, your job is very interesting. And what you're trying to do is make a personal computer that I can talk to. Correct? Uh, yes. And are you in charge of that here? Is that your responsibility? Uh, yes. Our group is doing um, investigating uh, areas in speech and language technologies. And that includes not only speech recognition, but also speech synthesis, having a computer talk to you. Only then can you have a conversation with the machine. And also, I think, as I've alluded earlier, really central to this speech recognition research is the uh, natural language understanding process. I think if you, if, you, if you asked me today if we had a black box that has everything the brain knows about language, uh, common sense, and reasoning, then we take the best recognizer and somehow plug them in together. My guess is you're going to have a great system already. So even though in voice recognition there's a lot more work to be done, I think there's even more work to be done in the areas of understanding language, of understanding common sense, reasoning, and how all of this ties together to build a real spoken interface in the conversational computer. Terrific. I mean, it's mind-blowing what you just said. Absolutely mind-blowing. Do you need to be a technologist to do this? I mean, is it for computer geniuses, your world, or are there other people who can also participate in this career? It sounds very interesting. Um, How literate do you have to be about that machine? How much do you have to know? I think to pursue a career in voice recognition, um, one would need to cover a couple of areas that I talked about earlier, such as linguistics, uh, computer science, um, signal processing, uh, mathematics, um, and perhaps psychology, um, and artificial intelligence. So I think the person needs to be interested in one or more of these areas and uh, learn about them in order to perform research or even development on this technology. But certainly to be a user, all of this should be hidden. He should be just, just be thinking he's talking to a, a machine that's as smart as a human. My last question, uh, Kai Fu. Um, Hal is, of course, people's great symbol for this whole thing. Now, Hal had a personality. Could you even conceive of that? Uh, is that a, can the machine ever get there in your mind, in your lifetime? Is that something you imagine? Um, I think that's something that could happen within our lifetime. Uh, one thing that we might be a little careful about is what, whether the machine is displaying emotion or, or um, intelligent behavior or whether it actually possesses uh, the human's way of doing it. I think right now the voice recognition is functioning completely differently from the way people do it. Yet it seems to work pretty well. So there may be ways that we can get the machine to have emotional behavior, to display more intelligence, but perhaps not in the same way that, that people do it. Um, so I think to come to this display of intelligence and emotions, I think we might see it within our lifetimes. But to emulate our brain and do exactly what people do, I think that's probably a much harder problem. <laughs> Very good. Excellent.